Hello, I'm Taj, digitally known as Tropic Vibes, the host of Nifty Business, where we highlight NFTs and explore Web 3.0 as we move from pure speculation to creating real world value. Have you ever seen those ads for Ancestry.com or 23andMe? They collect a sample of your saliva to sequence your DNA. This information can be used to find family members or discover your heritage, and much more. Most of these companies are big central databases. And as we know, this presents a lot of security and privacy issues. However, there is a Web3 solution for these problems. Today, I have the pleasure of sharing a discussion that I had with Aldo DePop, the CEO of Genomes.io. There is truly no limit to Web3, so let's just dive right into that conversation. I'm here with Aldo DePop, and he is the CEO of Genomes.io or the Genomes DAO. And I am absolutely excited to have this conversation. This is one of the projects that I found fairly early coming into Web3. And I just saw this great potential as to what this could come into. And I am so excited to have you on the show. So thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Dash. It's a real honor. As far as when I first found your project and understanding what you guys were trying to accomplish with the Genomes DAO, having an NFT, and also having tokens, everything, I said, wow, this is something that is just really touching every area of Web3. And I think there is so much potential in this. So what is a genome? Because I know a lot of people that might be listening to this, and I'm introducing the Genomes DAO, might not even know what a genome is. Yeah, no, that's a very good question. And we get that question a lot, actually. There's loads of scientific terminology going around for genomic data, genetic data. But the best way, and I think the most mainstream term that is being used is your DNA. So your genome effectively is your DNA sequenced in a laboratory. And if you were to do that, so if you were to take a cheek swab and put that in a kind of a, this laboratory tube and take that laboratory tube to a genetic laboratory, they would sequence that into a code. And that code is your DNA sequence. And another word for that is a genomic sequence or your genome. So that's what a genome essentially is. It's your DNA. And we even take it one step further. We also say it's the biological blueprint to who you are. Oh, awesome. That's a very good description. Very clear. And what is the value of having a genome or understanding that and sequencing it, I should say? There's loads of value to it. Basically, if you look at it from a helicopter perspective, from a very high level, and if you look at the rapidly evolving world of science and how much progress we booked, specifically looking at the genetic side of sins. And by the by, Today is a great day because it's a geneticist who won the Nobel Prize for his research on human evolution, on looking at the genes of the Neanderthal. And that's just one illustration of our DNA tells us who we are as a species, so to say. So it really unlocks a load of value, a load of knowledge about us human beings. A lot of information of that we have yet to discover. Right. So it's an it's this treasure of information. Just going back to that helicopter, this entire field, the specific research field in, in really sequencing your genome, it's only 22 years old. So the first human genome was sequenced 22 years ago. The cost of that was five billion dollars to get that going with loads of Ivy League research institutions involved in government. And it was done, of course, in this, this fortress of data with loads of people involved today. 22 years later, you can do the same sequence for less than $500. And already the kind of market leaders in this sequencing segment, they've already said, we can do it in a few years for $100. And that is a clear indication that the value is not as much in the act of the sequencing, it's really in the data and what we can learn from the data and how we can better understand ourselves as human beings and make predictions around diseases, find the right medicine for us and really evolve as a human race. So there's tremendous value to it. When I was reading the bio and description of your company, what have you, it says uh, genomes.io is a private and secure DNA data bank that puts the control back into uh, the individual. So what exactly does that mean, the control back into the individual that's holding it? 
Yeah, that again ties back to the fact that this market is 22 years old. The So after we did the $5 billion exercise, of course, it became slightly more mainstream. And then there was the rise of the direct-to-consumer genetic companies. And you might have heard of them. There's 23andMe, Ancestry.com, MyHeritage.com. So what they do is they they essentially say they will tell you things about your genetic ancestry, right? And they do that on the basis of the same cheek swap that I previously mentioned. You get a laboratory tubes in a kit sent to your home. You're then asked to part with some saliva that is then taken to a laboratory. And then in exchange for your laboratory tube and your sequence, you receive a report about whether you have ancestors in, in my case, Ireland or wherever in the world you find it interesting. To illustrate, I gave this as a present to my dad a few years back because he's very interested in his ancestry. Now, what he did not know is that at the same time that I paid this $150 in the Christmas sale for this kit, the company gets to keep the commercial rights over your data. So it ends up in a database of that company and then the company cross sells that information to the pharmaceutical industry and research organizations who then use it for the advancement of medicine and what, whatever their business is. And what we basically say is there are a couple of things that don't match the thinking of today anymore when you look at the operations of these company, uh, of such companies. One, we feel that from an ethical perspective, it is wrong to just take the commercial rights over someone's data and cross-sell it right? Without the explicit knowledge of that person, right? That's when we had the Cambridge Analytica case with Facebook data. And it's like people need to be informed if their data is going to be used for such a purpose, right? The second part to that is that a lot of these companies claim like, oh, no, it's fine because we anonymize your data. Now, I can tell you there's no such thing as anonymizing your DNA data, because your DNA data can at all times be traced back to you. So that specific formula or that explanation is flawed. And there have been many cases in the past. Some of them are even very CSI kind of cases whereby they found the serial killer by basically using the DNA they found on the central DNA databases. And then they found family of the killer. And through the family of the killer, they found the killer. So even though that's you know, 100% and wherever we can help with such a crime investigation, we should. It's a clear kind of case that proves to you that there's no such thing as an anonymized data. You're always able to retrace the person once you have his or her DNA data in your hands. When you say you take the name of the tag, you're not anonymizing it. You're just taking the name of the tag. That's it. And then the, and the last element to it is that we feel that in this day and age, and here's where decentralized science and decentralized finance and Web3 comes in. Technology these days is able to involve all stakeholders from the person that parts with the saliva to the laboratory that sequences it to the organization, the big organization that uses millions of these samples for their research. Every stakeholder in this process can be rewarded if the data is queried. So it's working just with an intermediate organization who passes the data on and just changes hand with the data. That's a little bit archaic thinking. And this is very much where Web3 comes in, if that makes sense. It does make sense. And that's a very important topic because a lot of people are worried about, of course, the big one that you said was the Cambridge Analytica. I think that was a tipping point for a lot of people that caused them to really wonder what kind of information are we giving out? And as you said, with the whole DNA is something that's very unique. Honestly, that is something I never even really thought about. I've never used any of the other services. However, I did remember that they always said that it is randomized and anonymized, so it can't be traced back to you. But as you said, it's, it, that's impossible. That doesn't make any kind of sense. So that is a good service or an idea that I think you guys are bridging together and in infusing that Web3 values with also your personal values. Yeah. And a couple of things that I also want to say here is like the, there's the way I interpret Web3 is basically changing from centralized into decentralized thinking. So working with systems that are trust based into systems that are by default trustless. Right. And so the thinking with tools like Facebook 
or the decentralized databases that these direct-to-consumer genetic companies have, they basically work under the assumption that there's a trust relationship between the consumer and, let's say, the CEO of the company. So the CEO of the company says, listen, I'm going to do my utmost to keep your data safe. I have a database. Here is my kind of security measures. Here's how we could talk about how your data is secure and safe. And hey, the CEO is doing a great job. He or she might be very serious. It's really true. They're really doing whatever they can do to keep your data safe, right? But at the end of the day, it is in a database that can be read and used by everyone, right? So even if the CEO is not malicious, is basically very willing to help and accommodate, what happens when the company gets taken over? And if there's a new CEO in town, this CEO doesn't have this trust relationship with you as a consumer. This CEO only sees a central database, right? Ancestry.com was sold, I believe, in 2020 for 4.7 billion to Blackstone. Let that amount sink in, 4.7 billion. The reason why they bought this company is because of this enormous database that it has on the level of genetic data. It's not because they're interested in the ancestry of myself that I have Irish ancestors. They are interested in the data. And the fact that they bought such a company is also a clear sign that they want to do more with the data. So the now moving from centralized to decentralized. So we are a decentralized infrastructure. And this essentially means that we are an infrastructure of vaults. And in those vaults, you have your genomic data. So how it works is you would do the same exercise as you would do with a direct-to-consumer genetic company. We send to your home a kit. That kit contains a tube. Via a cheek swab, you send us your sample of your saliva. We send that to a laboratory. However, then, after sequencing, your genome is ingested into a vault on our infrastructure, right? Once it's on there, you receive a notification, and your sequence in the laboratory, everything that remains is destroyed. The only version of your sequence that is available is the one in the vault. And the only person that has the keys to that vault is you. So we essentially work like a MetaMask or like a bank account, whereby you are the holder, you are the decision maker of what happens with your data from then on and into the future. The only thing that we can do, and we hope you will, of course, participate, but you don't have to if you don't want to, is when a research company, a pharmaceutical company, or another organization that you know would like to query your DNA data consults us and says, hey, I would love to work with the data, we can send then a notification to you, and you can give us the explicit permission whether you want to work with this, yes or no. On top of that, we also provide the same amounts of reports and same amounts of data and surveys as these direct-to-consumer genetic companies do, because we have our own team of bioinformaticians, and they will continuously get in contact with you, telling you, hey, here's a new report about any allergies you're susceptible for, or here's a, whether you, you know, about the eye color of your offspring, or what, whether you, you have it in you to become an athlete. All these new genetic findings that day after day are being born, that's an exciting thing to be part of. And we will produce loads of these reports ourselves as well. So we hope that the vault holders want to participate on our infrastructure, retaining the ownership and rights over their data, and only participating when they actually want to. And if they do, that they're kept in the loop and also receive a financial reward should there be any commercial stakes going on there. It's very interesting because that's another thing I never really thought about either. What are they doing with the data? I just was under the impression that they were selling the genomes and that's how they're making their money. But it seems like it's probably even at a discounted rate. Is that basically how the general model of this industry usually was? Is like they're sending, selling it cheap upfront to the consumer and then making the revenue itself from the data? Correct. Yeah, okay. That's correct. So they, there are a couple of things where we are different. So they are until today, and that, that might change, but they were in the business of uh, sequencing your exome. And your exome is the same as your genome, but a lighter form of that. To give you a great scale, your exome is sequenced at 5x, whereas your genome is sequenced at 30x. So your genome is a clinically graded data available to you, the most granular kind of version there is available to date in the mainstream market. So that is what we deliver. The direct-to-consumer genetic companies, they did sequencing at an exome scale, but you're right, they let you as the individual pay for that sequencing. 
So what you, they basically, what they give you in exchange for the sequencing is this report. And they advertise on Good Morning America or what other shows, and they go for the emotional component. So they basically show you like, hey, long lost family members, you can find them through our database. They tell you about people that have found each other, loads of emotional stories that of course catches on. That's also a good exercise in a way, but it's not applicable to everyone. Not everyone is interested to find their long lost cousin through the database. So they try to advertise the benefits of keeping the database centralized. They're trying to sell that to you. Whereas we say you can have all these benefits, but keep your data decentralized, right? There's no reason why not to do it. And in effect, you would then make this genomics market a lot more equitable because these companies, when you say making money, that's an understatement. We're talking in the hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars that they make from cross-selling your information. Make no mistake, these are not small amounts, right? This is huge money that they're making from cross-selling the data. This is not just a little pocket money on the side. The question I would have is, because you said we have the keys for when we hold our data, our DNA, where exactly is that stored? Is that stored on our computers itself? Or is that on, where exactly is that some network? That's a very good question. So we work with, we haven't, we're not just, genomic cowboys on our own. So we work with two very strong companies in the market, in the market that we want to be in. So on, on one hand, when it comes to the encryption and vault storage of the data, we work with a technology of AMD. So AMD is the biggest hardware company in the world. They make these microprocessors and devices, and they have an te encryption technology called AMD SEV. And with their tools, we built a software on which our vaults are built, all right? Now, then we work with cloud providers that can take on the storage of these vaults, which are very specific cloud providers. These are not Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud or whatever. These are very specific to our type of technology. And then with the AMD SEV technology also comes the advantage that they have AMD servers. So AMD servers are used to when we work, because we don't only work with individuals, we also work with governments and national sequencing initiatives that basically say, we want to retain ownership of the data also on a cloud storage perspective, effectively meaning that they don't want the data to leave the country. You don't want to put your data on, do the cloud hosting in, an, in another country, you want to keep it in your own country. And with the AMD servers, you are able to do that. Right? So that is one side of the formula. Then the other side is where blockchain comes in. Because what a lot of people, if they want to very quickly explain about what it is that we're doing, they say, oh, you put genomic data on the blockchain or on the chain. That is not at all what we do. We don't put any genomic data on the chain. That would be a very wrong misinterpretation of what we do. So where we use the blockchain is we make sure that on the chain, it is recorded when your data is being queried. So we keep an auditable trail of when your vault is being consulted by which organization at which moment in time. So we can assure that you only work with one version of the truth and that you don't, you know, that you can't make a snapshot and then copy paste and send it along, that you just work with one ledger and that ledger is queried and that you can read up on when it was used by whom. So that is where the blockchain comes in. And then of course, there's the entire decentralized finance, DeFi aspect of it all, because we have a utility token and a governance token. Okay, it's very interesting. And so I'm gonna try to segment my questions in there because I, I just opened up with probably 10 more questions that I could possibly <laughs> ask about this because it's very interesting. Let's say I only wanted to share a section of it. Let's say it's about, I don't know, like my taste or something. I enjoy coffee. I'm drinking coffee right now. So let's say it's like a coffee company that wants to do some sort of tasting information. Can I just share that with them and not necessarily everything? Sure. And just to clarify, you would never share any data directly with them. So what happens is the coffee company, I like this example, by the way, we should think of that. I love it. Your sequence exists of something that we call base pairs. So these are loads of base pairs attached to each other. So you have a base pair in your genomic sequence that speaks to your taste for coffee, for instance. I don't know if it exists, by the way, but let's assume it does. The coffee company then indeed says, hey, we're interested in querying your votes, looking at the coffee taste of people. So can we indeed target those specific base pairs? But 
The transaction is not that we then, for those who would allow us, give away the base pairs, like the actual data to the company. That's not what we do. The company gives us a query. So the company says, here's our query, here's what we wanna know. And we help them submit that to our vaults, right? Let's say 200 volts say yes. So our infrastructure, we receive a notification of a coffee company shares. I wanna query 200 volts. The 200 volts are then aggregated into their own virtual laboratory about coffee taste. And in that vaulted environment, the query takes place. So the query is sent to those vaults and the results of that query are then shared with the company. So it's not that any there's any data leakage. It's not that any kind of the vault is partly opened and then that specific part of the data is shared with the company at hand, no the research results of their questions are shared with the company and on a confidential basis, of course, because it's not like a public information, but that is then shared with the company. And then we have something which is called the repeat consent protocol, whereby, because often these are not like very straightforward questions, the coffee company has a follow-on question. So who likes mocha in their coffee or whatever? So then that's a follow-on question. So of the 200 volts, it would only apply to 50 volts. So then they can come back to query the 50 volts you know, something like that. So through elimination, through populating the vaults in their own virtual laboratory, through further fine tuning the query, the company or the organization can find out a lot by working with, with our infrastructure. Okay. that That's very interesting. I like that. that. That sounds something that could be very beneficial on both sides. And I think that'd be really a fun job. I enjoy data and sifting through things. So that seems like that'd be just very interesting. I could see where a researcher or anyone that's really trying to develop anything would just have immense amount of ability to use this and be very interested in what you guys are doing. The question I have now is now that we we uh, cleared up the fact that the genome itself is not stored on the blockchain and that is just the the transactions and who is accessing and what have you. As far as NFTs because I know that NFTs were a big part of what you guys were doing when you first or at least when I first discovered you. So how exactly did that play into the business model? Sure, yeah. The NFT is basically part of this amazing journey into the DeFi world. And it started for me personally, actually, when we introduced our utility token Gene to the market in October 2021. And so we did a token sale on Miso, a marketplace of, of sushi. And we were very happy that it was a successful launch of our Gene token, our utility token, so people could reap financial rewards from their vault being queried. That was the entire idea behind introducing this, uh, this utility token. And uh, to my surprise, behind basically the people who bought the token were these amazing people, bioinformaticians, medical doctors, former employees of 23andMe, researchers, but also just people just interested in science or decentralization of data altogether that basically wanted to stay involved with the company. And we assembled in our Discord and we set up a DAO. So they became DAO members. And we did not only introduce a utility token, but we also created a governance token called GNOME, G-N-O-M-E. And the governance token was meant then to incentivize these people of now 2000 plus people who basically cared for the company and for our vision to make the genomics market more equitable and wanted to share their ideas. And I, it was so heartwarming for me I at one point got a message from someone saying, I know you don't know me, but I can't sleep ever since the moment that I found out about genomes.io because there's so many ideas that come to mind and I'm so excited about this. And please let me think along and whatever. And Discord is just such a great tool to be in direct connection with those people, right? And to involve those people on so many levels. So first there was this kind of very supportive community that really embraced genomes.io that was into the token, but not only into the monetary end of things, really into the growth of us as a DAO and as a company. And the next step of that was, of course, looking at the NFTs and what we could do there. And we were looking into introducing an NFT, but of course, connecting the digital asset that we had of the genetic cat, because that's the name of our NFT, which is a beautiful artwork of a cat, but all digital, but connecting that to a real life utility. And loads of people were very excited because they said, hey, 
here you you buy this genetic cat, but at the same time, you also become a vault holder. So you also get a kit sent to your home. You can, through the kit, sequence your genome and open a vault on the infrastructure and benefit from all the advantages that you know we can offer you throughout, right? And that led to a very successful NFT sale. We weren't overhyped, so we didn't sell out in half an hour and sold the tens of thousands or whatever crazy stories you hear, but we sold a, a fair few, a very good amount. And I believe there, there are a few more available on OpenSea because the remainder we put on OpenSea because we were like, okay, we're not going to host this on our own marketplace. So the remainder that we had, we put on OpenSea where they are still selling to date. So that's, it's a really exciting venture it was to be part of. Okay. So if anyone uh, purchases those now off of OpenSea, they, they would get all those same benefits, what have you, or is it like a select few of them or how? A tremendously good deal, I believe. I don't think we have a lot of loads available anymore, but it's still available. So with the market <laughs> as it is, I think you could get it for a very good price and there are only a few more available, but yeah, you could get all those benefits if you were to buy the genetic ad. You do need to look that it has the utility marked on it because you can, there are also already on the secondary market, there are those of which the kits are used. So you do need to make sure it's marked properly. I'm going to definitely have to check that out myself because as someone who just loves the space, I love collecting and everything, but also just seeing the value of what this actually does. This is more than just collecting and having fun. This is actually something that really could be life-changing and it could be something that could change the future for just a lot of people. I think this was one of the most interesting projects and just to be able to buy into that and knowing that it's on OpenSea and it's still active, I think is very important because a lot of those projects from October, the time frame that you're speaking about disappeared, but this one is just getting started. Yeah, let's hope so. We're very happy that we've good interest from loads of people, including the pharmaceutical sector, also important, right? That they are also invested in making the genomics market more equitable, that they're looking for a better acquisition process of their data and working with the data and making sure that it's this market evolves as well with them, which is very important. And then also on the other side, that individuals care for what happens with their data. And that's what I say in every interview. You don't necessarily need to like us. You don't need to go ahead with genomes DAO or genomes.io if you don't want to, but at least consider that your genomic data has value. Don't just wave it away. Don't go with the easy, cheap DNA product because the price you pay for that is way, way too high, right? In your lifetime, you will have multiple phone numbers, multiple home addresses, but you will only have one genomic sequence. And once it's out there, it's out there. So be very aware, not only of your DNA data, but also DNA data of your loved ones, of what they do with it. Interesting. I know we always talk about mass adoption, so I don't really use that word. For, I guess you'd say, more people wanting to come into this world and getting their genomes and through this matter. Do you think the Web3 aspect is more of a bigger hurdle or the actual understanding what a genome is? Well, that's an interesting question. I think there, there are a couple of things when you say this world. When you say this world, we basically mean the United States and a, a good amount in Western Europe where the 90% of the genomic sequencing has taken place thus far. But let's look at Asia, Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa. There are so many territories in this world whereby we haven't even started with genomic sequencing. So can you imagine the infinite treasure of information that you could get there from starting sequencing there and doing that properly and delivering that service at scale to people there, what that would unlock on, on the level of the disease prevention, the level of developing precision medicine, all those things. So that's an overall awareness about what your genome is and what it does for scientific progress as a whole. And I think that is not Web3 necessarily, that is just across the board. And because this market is 22 years old, there were only so many people who realized that it actually has value. Now more and more people are catching on to it because not a week goes by or there hasn't unfortunately been a violation whereby one organization was cleverly trying to get their hands on DNA data at scale from the other or there are so many breaches, hacks and whatever. So it's becoming more mainstream and people come more faster to an understanding of what to do with DNA data and how to use it and how to apply it and what it can be used for. So I hope that overall education on your DNA is going to help. Then secondary, I think, yes, the Web3 community is very uh, peculiar, of course, about their identity, about working with trustless systems. I, can, I think they can take the lead 
and showing people the way on how to use data, and we call this decentralized science rather than decentralized finance, on how to use data and keep the data with you, still having all the advantages of the research, right? So not going into personal data breaches, but still having the ability to do the research, which is the earlier example that I mentioned. And I think they can have the lead in what's the technological precedent that needs to be used. Because in effect, there's not going to be any reason to do it the old-fashioned way anymore. Everyone will be forced to doing it in a more equitable way. And we hope that we can be a significant part of that process. Yeah, that'd be very interesting. And one thing I do like that you said the rest of the world, because I haven't mentioned this in the beginning of this, because I'm actually I'm physically located in Jamaica, right? The island of Jamaica. And I know genomes and DAOs and all these things is really not really talked about here. However, that something that I think about a lot is being an island, the genetics is pretty locked in, right? I mean, there's immigration and people coming here and what have you, but the gene pool is not that diverse. So yeah. that is something I, I was always thinking about. It was like, you know, it'd be interesting to do like a genetic study on an island. We are. It's, it's funny you mention we are talking to uh, an entire island and doing sequencing there as well, specifically because of that reason. And specifically also because these islands, unfortunately, have a history of being exploited, among others, for their data. So our solution is brought in there on such an island with local storage and kind of all the benefits, but giving the ownership back to the people, right? Because through the vaults, the people can still use it and they can reap the financial rewards for it. So we're doing research at scale on an island to start exactly that process. And yes, from a genetic perspective, it is a, it would be fascinating to look at and it would be very valuable. Yes, 100%. What sparked my idea as to why it would be so interesting to do a genetic study on an island was a few years back because the main family business that I'm in is actually groceries. That's my day job. And we had this huge summit where this uh, gentleman came down from the University of Georgia and was basically explaining why they had to import pigs onto the island is because the gene pool was so bad that the meat was terrible. And I was starting to think, I was like, that's the idea with pigs. And they had to end up getting a whole bunch of pigs from uh, Canada and elsewhere to get a better gene pool within the mix of things. So it was better tasting pork. I was like, I wonder what kind of issues that we have as people that are on the island because the gene pool isn't as diverse as a a very small island. So I thought it would have been very interesting to have one of those uh, genetic studies done there. It would be most definitely. So examples of organizations we're working with, there's one organization that is in our pipeline that is doing research in a community in Mexico. And it's a very specific community and they're doing research in early onset Alzheimer's in that community. Because there is a very high percentage of people in there that gets this very aggressive form of Alzheimer's. And they are trying to discover what which genetic mutation actually causes it. So there's something to be said for looking at a very homogenous data set or collection of data sets to discover maybe very kind of peculiar ailments or diseases that that people have that maybe people get sooner than others. A very famous one that, you know, of course, with the pandemic and everything you hear often is long COVID. So some people claim that genetically they are more susceptible to getting long COVID than others. So what's the variant here? What makes people get COVID faster or be more susceptible to get long COVID at the end of the day. There's loads to be said for that. And yeah, so we're doing, we're working with communities on that level for that specific community to find out like, what are we dealing with here? And also looking at a prevention perspective. So how can we prevent getting the disease or alternatively, how can we develop the right medicine, precision medicine, if you will, that really works with curing our population, right? And not just any human being, but really dosing it on such a level that it would really work for people with that specific genetic profile. So yeah, you're very right. There's a lot to be said for that. Yeah, it's just very interesting. Again, as with everything that we've been speaking about, there's so much potential for that. And I would say this whole space with the genomes and everything, I think the thing is just, I think it's just awareness. And it's a matter of time where I think it's going to be one of those things where it's just as common as figuring out what your blood type is, for example. But how far off do you see that is since we're only 22 years into this industry itself? Do you think that would come sooner than later or do you think that's really far off? It's, uh, the thing is, it goes on such an accelerated level. There are two sides to this. That you know, also taking into consideration the Theranos story, whereby I think science and specifically when it comes to our health as human beings 
at some moment, we are all tempted of seeing it as a magic wand, right? So you say, oh, it could do this and then that and that. But we need to be careful that we don't over fantasize here, that we don't get carried away with what is possible. And it's always good to look at the potential and the possibilities, but do you need to be realistic about where we are today versus where we can be in the future? That's not to say that you shouldn't look at the future or shouldn't embrace kind of future possibilities, but it's also good to embrace what's out there today. I want to have that said because I don't want to come across as someone who's trying to sell a magic wand and say, here's what's possible. Specifically speaking about genomic data, the data, because we found our way into sequencing it, but we also found our way in how to investigate the data. And the interesting piece here is that one bit of research builds upon the other and then the other and the other, creating this exponentially growing effect of finding out a lot more about your genomic data a lot faster than we think we should. But that's all because of the research once you have the data. It's all the same. We're not promising you this little, how do you say that, a drop of blood that we can tell you everything, you still need to do the whole sequencing. And we do need to get a proper saliva sample from you to get it sequenced properly. And right, and it sometimes unfortunately happens that people don't send us enough. So we need to ask them to do it again. That's, that's the unfortunate part. The good part is that once you have the data, you can read the data. And I think the possibilities of reading the data, that is going a lot faster because our understanding is accelerating on that level as to what we can match the genetic data with. And that brings me to what you said is like, it, we work with increasingly with more healthcare companies that read another type of, health data, but want to combine that with their genomic cousins, so to say. So they basically want to have us as an application within their solution so they can match the health data they have with the genomic data that we deliver of the same patient. So that at the end of the day, you would have your entire profile genomically and otherwise available to you and everything can be read in one go if you would want to. So that that could be a possible application in the future whereby you can be profiled completely in everything on your blood type, on kind of your GP records to your genomic data that everything is together in one go and that's you. And then if you something happens to you, you go to a hospital, then they have everything about you available with the click of a button if you give your consent for it. So that could be the exciting bit here that, that would help you on that level. Very interesting. So for someone who is listening to this and says, wow, this is just amazing. I would love to get involved in this or have my DNA sequenced. Uh, how? What's the best way to do that through your company? Yeah, so you can go to genomes.io. That's our website. And you can buy the kit now. If you register, you can apply for buying the kit and we'll have a kit sent to you. You can buy, if you're into NFTs, go to OpenSea and buy our genetic cat. I think now is a really good time to get in there. So if there are still some available, I would definitely go for that. Um, you can follow us on Twitter. So we're very active on Twitter. So you can check us out there at GenomesDAO. Um, and also in our Twitter, you will in our profile, you will find a link to our Discord. So you can join our Discord community, become a DAO member if you'd like, and participate in all the benefits we have to offer there. Okay, awesome. And this is worldwide, I'm assuming? You can ship the, the, the saliva and stuff from anywhere, or is this yes, US? Yes, yeah. No, we, are, we operate uh, globally. Okay, so lovely. Last sales, we did in over 35 countries, right? So it's people from everywhere. Very good. If Jamaica is not on that list, look for it to be there there pretty soon because I would love to have my full genome sequenced. We'd love having you, even though no one would ever know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you very much. You covered a lot. It's something is just very exciting. And I, you gave me a list of things to go research even further. So I really appreciate your time and sharing this. It's, I think it's a great vision, a great mission. And I think it's a shared value with Web3, of course that you are proposing here. So I think this is going to be a very beneficial episode and I think people will be very interested in it. Thank you so much for having me and it's been an honor and a pleasure and good luck with the podcast. Wasn't that amazing? I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. As usual, I'll be leaving the link to this information in case you want to follow up However, I was just so excited to see such a practical and powerful use of blockchain technology, and I'd love to know your thoughts on all of that. Please feel free to reach out to me at Tropic Vibes on Twitter, but as usual, I just want to thank you for taking time to listen to this as we're learning and building Web3 together. So until next time, later. The Nifty Business Show is not investment advice. It provides insights and information within the space. 
As with anything, please do your own research before making a decision whether you're making an investment or a purchase.